Hey guys, Arlisha here and welcome to another video. Today we're going to be making a couple of blue paints and I'm going to be answering some of the questions you guys have been asking the most. The first color we're going to be making is, I had previously been calling it Payne's Gray, currently calling it Indigo. I don't really know, I'm just, it's, it's this bluish grayish color. The first three swatches, as well as the one on the very end, are actually different versions of indigo. The first three are indigo by M. Graham, White Knights, and Schminka. The fourth swatch is my color, which as you can see is much, much warmer. And the last one is Daniel Smith's Payne's Gray. Just wanted to give you a little bit of a gauge for how this color varies from other colors by the same name. Indigo is an interesting color, which we'll talk about very soon. But before we talk about traditional indigos, I want to tell you about this color that I'm making for you today. It's a combination of two pigments, being PB60, which is Indian Throne Blue, and PR101, which is Indian Red in this case. It's a cooler version of PR101, so more like an Indian Red as opposed to a warmer Venetian Red. One of the biggest challenges when making a multi-pigment color is actually just finding a proper balance between the two pigments, which you guys will see was my biggest struggle in making this color. I kind of set myself up for having a really hard time right in the beginning, which you guys will see very shortly. And mixing multiple pigments together is difficult because not every pigment reacts the same. PB60, the Indian Throne Blue, for example, it takes a lot of mulling. The color can be very grainy and it's a little bit more difficult to disperse, kind of like the red we made in my last paint making video. The Indian Red, PR101, is the opposite. It dissolves into the water super, super easily and it has a very, very high tinting strength. So when I start to mix these two colors together, you're gonna see that that Indian Red, it disperses right away and is very, very overpowering in this mixture. And that's where I made a mistake. For whatever reason, I just added way too much red. My indigo technically is a blue with a little bit of a brownish red in it to desaturate, and for some reason I just messed up my ratios completely. And if you look closely, you can see that the Indian red, it does a lot of mixing while the blue kind of sits on the bottom. That blue pigment needs more time to disperse and it needs a lot more mulling, so these two pigments just don't react the same. To be honest, Honest, they're not really a perfect pairing for making a custom color like this one. Indigo, there is a genuine indigo, but a lot of companies make indigo with a mix of several colors. So common colors used to make indigo include some sort of phthalo blue or violet pigment or black, or maybe some red to desaturate and warm up the blue. For me, I'm going with just two pigments and kind of utilizing that neutralizing power of blue and brown mixed together, but it's a very reddish brown, so I'm getting something that's much warmer. Warmer. I spent a lot of time trying to bring this particular batch back to something closer to what I wanted and in the end ended up with several containers of paint that I put away to work in smaller batches because I had to keep adding more binder so that I could add more blue and I ended up with seriously insane amounts of paint and looking back on it I actually kind of really like the idea of just using something similar to what I have here and making a new color, something closer to like a warmer neutral tint, I think could be really nice. And then I wouldn't have to stress about trying to push everything so far back towards blue. You may notice that the mix you're seeing right now looks still very much like Indian red, but because that color is so, so strong, the color when it's wet actually looks a little bit different than when you swatch it and put it on paper. It looks very, very brown here, but when I swatch it, it looks cooler and closer to like a grayish, blackish thing. Yep, I'm, I'm good at describing colors. But when you look at the paint itself pretty close up, you can see that it's still really, really grainy, and that's the blue. It doesn't have enough binder. You only need a tiny, tiny bit of the blue pigment compared to the ratio of binder, and the Indian Red uses much more pigment, so I was just kind of setting myself up for a hard time from the beginning. In the end, this was as close as I got. You can see I have my goal over there on the one side, so that is the finished color from a previous batch. That was what I wanted, and this was as close 
close as I got with one of the split batches and I needed to just step away and leave it for now and move on to something different. I decided to also include an easier color in this video just because I didn't want every paint making video or at least to kind of build a running theme of this color was really difficult and didn't turn out the way I wanted it to because they're not all that way. Some of them like this cobalt teal which is made from PB28 which is the color we're working on right now. This color comes together so nicely, so easily. It disperses right away, takes very little mulling, I think that I only worked on this one for maybe 20 minutes, 20 to 30 minutes, and it's a one-to-one -one ratio, equal parts pigment and binder, and it just wants to be paint. It wants to dissolve, it wants to disperse, and it's nice and easy and simple. So while I'm working on this easier color, I figured I would go ahead and answer a couple of the questions you guys have been asking, especially in the most recent video. The two questions that I got the most were about using a bowl or a mortar and pestle, and also about when you know you need to add more binder or more pigment. So let's start by talking about the bowl. A lot of people had asked, oh, why don't you do your initial mixing of the pigment and the binder in a bowl and then put it onto the slab? Wouldn't that make it easier? And I don't really think it would. I think ultimately it would just leave me with another surface and more materials that needed to be cleaned and I'm worried that I wouldn't be able to get all of the paint out of the bowl and onto the slab and then I would just be losing paint and I wouldn't have as much to work with. Doing it this way directly on the slab allows me to use the same tools throughout so I'm always keeping that paint in the same space and I don't feel like I'm losing anything. And making paint isn't really like mixing pancake batter or just combining ingredients to like you would with food for example. It needs to be mulled so you need some abrasive firm surfaces to really push the pigment and the binder together. You can use a mortar and pestle especially if you're doing small batches. My friend Vero who has the YouTube channel Vero no Yume here on YouTube, I'll leave a link to her paint making video. She used a mortar and pestle but she even mentions that it's not the ideal way to make paint. She did it because she had it. Having a larger flatter surface area for mulling just makes the whole process go much more smoothly. So this is what I would recommend. But of course, if you want to experiment with different methods, you're more than welcome to do that. As far as the question of when to add more binder or more pigment, you usually know you need to add more binder if the color rubs off a lot when the swatch is dry with a paper towel and you rub that with a paper towel, if the color comes off onto your paper towel, then you need more binder. If your pigment is very, very grainy when you're trying to mull it, you probably need more binder, depending on how long you've been working on it, if you've given it some time and it's just not coming together. If the color is very gummy and your swatch looks very, very shiny and you're not getting any rubbing off when you swatch a color, then you might need more pigment. So you have too much binder and there's kind of extra space in there where you could put more color and then you can add more pigment. I know that seems kind of simple and straightforward and a lot of it is kind of a trial and error sort of thing. There is no one recipe that works for every color. I even have some colors that need a little bit more honey or a little bit more glycerin depending on how dry the pigment is or how it absorbs into the binder. You don't have to add honey and glycerin. Gum Arabic is the most important part of the binder, but I choose to use them because they help with the flow and rewettability of the paints themselves once they're all dry. A few of you had even asked about why you would even take the time to make watercolors. It's definitely not the most time efficient way to make paints or to have paints to use. And in a lot of cases, it's not even the most affordable way to do it. You know, you can find pigments especially when you're buying stuff in bulk or in larger batches, you know, one container of pigments going to make a ton of paint. So there are some ways in the long term that it can be cheaper to buy them like this than buying individual expensive tubes of professional paint, but it doesn't have to be. There are some pigments that are really expensive and you could easily make it cost more than if you just bought your own commercially made paint. But the same thing kind of goes for a knitter who likes to make sweaters or a carpenter who builds tables. Paying for the material and the time it takes to make those things doesn't always cost less or save you time, but that's not why crafters do their craft. 
we do it because we enjoy the process. And also for me, I like to share the process. I like to make videos. So I'm doing paint making as a hobby, not just as a quicker, faster, cheaper way to have paint. I like this process. I like doing it. I like making paint. Sometimes things don't go the way I expect or want them to, and it takes longer, but that's okay. I'm learning, and it's something that I enjoy doing, and the fact that I can make videos about it means that the money I earn from doing this type of content supports the hobby, which is fantastic and amazing and really important. Thank you guys so much for watching this video and for asking questions. I know there are so many questions I can't get to in every video, but I'm gonna keep answering questions and I will get to as many of those as I can over time. This is a long running series, hopefully, and we're learning together. So again, let me know what you think of the two different processes I showed you today. One came together super easy and one did not, but that's okay. We learn and we keep going and it's fun. I'll see you guys in the next video. Bye-bye.